Welcome to the Music and Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily Williams Birch, and this podcast, it exists for you. Whether you're a music lover, an educator, a choir member, each week we bring guests to the show to help explore what matters in music. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome to the show. Hello, and welcome to the Music and Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily Williams Birch, and I live in Savannah. And the jasmine is blooming, and this is what my voice gets to sound like. Thanks for enduring it today. Today's guest is a teacher spotlight episode. We're talking to Augusto Gill, lovingly referred to as Augie Gill. And he is a middle school master teacher and show choir and pianist extraordinaire. And today we talk about making music meaningful. One of my favorite things he said is that making music for music's sake, we can't forget that that's part of it. And that it's it's our job to give singers that space to just be a part of music, to process through music, and to not forget among all of it. Like, yes, we love music, but we have such an opportunity. And we have to remember that the students and the singers coming into our spaces have other things going on. And music means different things for everyone. It's that process and that that community that we get to build together that is so important. What I love about this episode is that it's inspiring. It's it's a quick one, so you're going to enjoy it from beginning to end, but we talk about fostering relationships. We talk about teachers as performers and how to promote more teachers that are performers and teachers who understand and love the voice. But then we really dive into what does it mean to make music for music's sake and how can you do that in a way that is meaningful and impactful for everyone in the room. As always, this episode is brought to you by our friends at Kaleidoscope Adventures and the Kinnison Choral Company. Jump over to emilybirch.org slash sponsors to check out more. We are so thankful that they make this possible. And if you want to join the conversation or you just want to support the show, you can pay just a couple dollars a month over at patreon.com slash musicedmatters. Join our monthly live conversations, suggest episodes, get monthly bonus episodes, and so much more, y'all. Podcasting is a blast, but only because you exist. So thank you for listening. Without further ado, Making Music Meaningful with Augie Gill. Today on the Music Ed Matters podcast, we're talking to one of my dear teaching friends, Mr. Augusto Gill. Hey, Augie. Hello. How are you? I'm so excited to finally have you on the podcast. I have to tell the listeners how I met you. So I was auditioning for grad school for my doctorate. And you just showed up full of smiles and energy for a super late night sushi dinner while I was in (laughs) town doing my exploring, auditioning or whatever. And I'm like, this guy's the real deal. And then I remember seeing you again at our kickoff to the year. And you just pop right up and you're like, hello, so personable (laughs) from the beginning. You are a fabulous human being. Tell the listeners who's Augie Gill. Well, it's funny that you brought up um, the sushi dinner and then also just like the whole energy thing, because um, at that point, I was kind of the most energetic in the room uh, and we had no clue who was going to be showing up uh, until you showed up. And so then um, I think I remember describing your personality type, like your Myers-Briggs personality type is just E, 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 E um, (laughs) to people after that, um, just extrovert all the way. And so um, I'm really glad that then we got to meet at the University of South Carolina and uh, and that we were able to spend some time there together. Um, Agreed. But yeah, I, uh, I finished my master's there and graduated in 2018. Um, I did music education before uh, I came to University of South Carolina to do my master's. Um, and so, but I never stepped into the classroom full time. I'd been there part time for a couple and a couple of placements. Uh, and then I coached like some show choirs and things like that when I was still lived in Tennessee. Um, but the spring semester of my, uh, uh, last year of my master's degree, I uh, stepped into a middle school in Lexington, South Carolina, part-time. And it was, uh, every, everything about a placement that I wanted to be in. Um, and it was a track to be full-time the next year. Uh, and so that's, that's where I still am. I'm at Meadow Glen Middle School in Lexington, South Carolina, which is a fantastic place to be. Uh, it's a EL school, expeditionary learning school. And so being able to learn about what that model is and how it serves students um, has been fantastic. And I'm super excited to take that um, with me when, whenever I'm ready to move on uh, from Meadow Glen. So. I'm really excited. Can we go back to how you got into this? Because I remember seeing you go to that first middle school placement and just fall in love with middle school. 
how did we even get to majoring in music? Tell us a little bit about your upbringing and how you found music. Yeah, sure. So I, uh, you know, had always been, uh, well, I'm from a super small town in Tennessee, uh, and um, music opportunities were not um, super uh, open and, and, and were not super available. And so um, obviously did a lot of singing in church, um, and I took some piano lessons. Uh, and then my middle school teacher, who I absolutely adored, retired, and I thought that was going to like break uh, my entire music making experience because she was also my piano teacher at the time. And, um, and so uh, fortunately I was able to kind of, you know, find a couple of extra places uh, beyond that uh, to, to make music again, mostly in the church. Um, and so uh, by the time I was in high school, um, I think I was in like every music class that I could be in by my senior year of high school. Um, my entire fall semester was all choir, including women's chorus. Um, because I like, I was able to, to pitch that I was like, I can, I can accompany and I can, you know, be the accompanist and that's how we'll do it. And so, um, so yeah. And, uh, and I got to the end of my senior year and was really interested in music. Um, but again, because I was like from such a small town and did not really see many successful musicians beyond like people who directed church choirs and, and maybe like, and teachers. Uh, I wasn't really sure that I wanted to do music as a profession. <clears throat> and I got a lot of pressure from my family to not do music as a profession. And so um, I'd spent a couple of years um, learning and doing some basic um, like sign, uh, American Sign Language interpreting. And so I had decided that I would kind of capitalize on that and continue um, learning and interpreting and networking with that and uh, working with a lot of the Spanish skills that I had developed. And then somewhere along the way, I decided I was gonna pick up French and try to pursue um, try to pursue interpreting full-time. Um, and so uh, made it to applications for colleges. And then my high school choral director paused and said, you know, you have to, you have to at least audition for music programs. Um, like she was like, it's, it's not an option. Uh, you have to at least audition if, if nothing, if for nothing else for the scholarships. And so I said, okay, you know, like I can at least sing in a choir or something. And then auditioned for a couple of music schools um, and just really fell in love with, with what I saw at those music schools of people applying music in different ways and, and people um, creating relationships with each other through music, which um, is mm -hmm. something that I hadn't seen a lot of up to that point. And then uh, was offered a scholarship for a really small school in Tennessee, um, Carson Newman University, and uh, decided, you know what, I like, let's, let's do this. And so, um, so kind of ditched all the interpreting <laughs> aspects yeah. of anything that I wanted to do and hopped into music. Um, and uh, the, for those first two years, I think I was that really annoying music major of like, I'm always in the practice room. And I had like 18 pieces of music on my freshman jury, which was insane. And uh, I mean, yeah, I was, I was correct. I was not um, probably like the, the most uh, relatable person in my first couple of years, but um, started to branch out and build relationships through um, other organizations like Residence Life and, uh, and established uh, a, a learning program about like LGBTQ students um, at my university, which was a hot topic at that point. And, um, uh, and then uh, moved on and decided, you know, music ed is where I wanted to go. And um, by the time I was a senior in college, um, decided that I'd loved music and loved teaching, um, but I wasn't really quite ready to go into a classroom yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, and honestly, at this point, I don't even remember why that was because I was working with middle schoolers um, for probably about 20 or 30 hours a week anyway, uh, through uh, just several colleagues that I had made uh, surrounding the, the university. Um, and so I was doing vocal training and I was doing um, coaching for two different show choirs there. And uh, it, was a, it was an awesome time and loved working with that age. Um, but then I decided uh, conducting is something that I really have a passion for and really loved. And so I started looking at um, some conducting schools and went to audition uh, at the University of South Carolina and then made my way there. And um, super glad that I was there at the time that I was um, because uh, you and I both can, you know, can really say that we got some of our experience under um, Dr. Larry White and some of our experience under Dr. Alicia Walker. And mm -hmm. uh, that was like probably one of the best ways that could have happened because it was such an awesome way to get all that different kind of information. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so uh, by the end of my master's degree, 
I was, I was ready to be in the classroom. Like I wanted to be on the other side, I think of the classroom instead of being in a desk uh, because mm-hmm. it, that was a long amount of school. And so, um, so I was ready to, to put, you know, everything that I had learned into practice. Um, and I know a lot of our colleagues um, who were interested in public school teaching jobs um, were really interested in high school. And so um, again, I've always loved the middle school age Mm-hmm. and uh, think that it's a really important and formative time. Uh, but also, I don't think you have to sacrifice quality of the music that you make um, or difficulty or any of those things um, just because you're working with middle schoolers. And so um, it was in it was in December of 2017 that Dr. Walker had mentioned, well, you know, I, I know you're probably looking to go to a school. There's a school in Lexington. And they don't have a director this year and it's a really strong school. And I, and that really confused me because I was like, you know, what do you mean they don't have a director? And so um, due to a lot of different crazy things that had happened right before the, the beginning of that school year, uh, the director who was there was offered a position um, at the high school pretty much right across the street. And, um, and that was something that was going to be super important for her and, um, and a great way for her to continue the program that she had built. And so she moved there and, um, and they hired a long-term sub for the position that, uh, for her. And so, um, uh, that was a really difficult thing for that program, um, because of just kind of how last minute everything ended up being. Um, but that principal, uh, my principal currently, uh, said, you know, he didn't want to put someone in, uh, in a really rushed way. They didn't want to hire someone full-time last minute without being able to be really intentional about who they were going to bring in. And so I emailed uh, that principal in December and said, uh, hey, you know, I, this is who I am. Um, I already have a certification. I'm already certified. I'm just do- completing my master's degree and said that I'd love to work with him on some kind of schedule to where I could work with his students um, in the spring. And at first he uh, just said, you know, we're not going to start looking until about February to fill the position. Um, You know, we'll we'll keep you in mind. And then uh, about a week later, the drama teacher had also uh, for that school had gotten in touch with me uh, because she works really closely with the music program and said, hey, our principal is going to call you like we we really want you to come in and interview. Um, And so they they had talked to some mutual friends of ours and um, and saw actually looked at my resume and saw that I was certified and saw that, you know, um, that I could essentially just step into the classroom. They didn't need to really wait for anything to happen. And so I went to interview and um, even just from the interview, it was was obvious that it was a really great place to be and a really um, awesome place that serves students really well. And so uh, they brought me in beginning part-time in March of 2018. And so I was on campus at Meadow Glen, uh, about two and a half days a week. I was there, I think like Tuesdays, Thursdays, and like half of Fridays or something. Um, and so that was, that was a difficult time just because, you know, I was trying to be, build those relationships. And as with any position, you know, the, the students are going to be, you know, the, they belong quote unquote to, to the director of the pre of the you know, previously um, until you really establish those relationships. And so um, establishing relationships was really important to me, um, but also continuing a tradition of really strong music making um, that had been established uh, before I had, I had gotten the job. And so um, I put together a, a, almost a ragtag spring concert um, built out of music that was kind of given to me and, um, the students did fantastically, of course. Um, and then, and then from there, I got my contract to, to do full-time for the next year. And it was, um, a super exciting time because, uh, I had pretty much had that job in like, you know, three months before I graduated with my master's. And it was, uh, it was a super exciting place to be also just because of the, the educational model school followed and everything that school gets to do. So, I want to talk more about that educational model and those relationships in a second. And I'm so thankful for you sharing your story, but I have a couple of follow-up questions. Okay. I'm excited. Do you feel like you teach differently at the middle school level because of the experiences you did not have growing up? Oh, absolutely. I think, um, I, I think our principal highlights this every time someone in our school gets a student intern or a student teacher, um, they always say, you know, uh, take this opportunity to learn how to be the teacher that you wanted to have. And I think, um, 
I think in a lot of ways, I try my best. I, I'm sure there are days where I don't succeed, but I try my best every day to be um, be the teacher that I wanted to have growing up. And also um, just to be uh, someone, you know, that is visible to my students um, and also someone that is human, because I think um, when I was growing up, it was this, uh, of course, that was pre- almost everything internet how it is now but um uh you know is uh, teachers were very put together and teachers were always right and teachers were um you know they they had this uh it was almost like a different level of a human being um <clears throat> and sometimes students just need to know that you're human and sometimes we don't have good days either and um and that that there is uh, a humanness and emotion level to teachers that is also really important um because that's that's how you share vulnerability, which is, I think, a huge part of music making at that age. And so, um, so yeah, absolutely. I think uh, being able to, to be a teacher that um, I had or didn't have, um, I think mm -hmm. is something that can be really important at that age. Wonderful. I love that. Now let's talk about these relationships because I can tell just from your story of leading you from interpreting to music, which is all the same thing. It's all really based on relationships. Let's talk about how you foster relationships when you came in. Give us some examples and some ideas. So um, some of the relationship building when I first came into that position was built in because of the school model. And so it's, it's expeditionary learning school, um, which every time our principal says, when someone asks you what EL is, just tell them it's best practice, which is a really frustrating answer because no one knows what that means. Um, however, it is an honest answer because it kind of takes, I think, some of the best parts of every fantastic um, educational model for schools. And so um, part of those, uh, part of that model includes um, a social emotional learning time called crew. And so uh, there are lots of different um, uh, ways that that happens in other schools, but um, crew is a, a set of students that you may not normally see throughout the day that every, every teacher gets uh, at the very beginning of the day. And um, it's usually like 10 to 15 students per teacher. And it's where you really emphasize that relationship building aspect of who is in the room, um, how, do, how do we make connections with people who are similar and different from ourselves, um, how do we be leaders of our own learning, and how can we be leaders in our community or in our school. And then how do we take those relationships with us when we move on, when the students move on to another grade, to another school, um, how can they lean on those relationships uh, to be, um, you know, either leaders of their own learning or um, just find comfortable emotional connections because they've had those. And so that was a really important part of, uh, of building those relationships, which was built in, which was awesome. Um, and so it's awesome to be at a school that emphasizes creating those relationships. Um, but then also just in creating music, there is an innate relationship aspect of we are doing this together and I am asking you to do something that can be really scary to do in front of people you know or people you don't know, depending on the class, um, and and asking you to try new things, and also asking you to try new things with the with the possibility that you are not going to be good at those things immediately, right? And so, uh, so the relationship that comes along with that has to come from that sense of um, this is a safe place to try new things and to fail and uh, to fail upwards, to co constantly be trying and, and attempting um, with the willingness to try. And so um, I think that's a really fantastic part of music making at any level, but especially in the middle school uh, age, because you know they can cheer each other on or they, they recognize like, oh <laughs> yeah, we, you didn't quite make it that time, I didn't either. You know? And so, um, so there's a lot of that going on, which I think is really special. I love how you talk so much about the, the safety net that you've created. Are you writing these um, curriculums for the crew time or are they just conversations for someone who's listening that is looking to foster deeper relationships with their students and create a space where their middle schoolers feel comfortable to mess up? What are things that you're doing that are working? Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, the, our crew time um, is built around um, each grade level. And so for each grade level, there's a committee called the crew design team. And so um, uh, I've been on that committee often on the past couple of years, and we really work to uh, create meaningful times, whether that is conversation or whether that is an actual lesson that is put together. 
um, about, uh, you know, something that, that is, is meaningful at that time. And so, um, certain heritage months will receive, you know, highlight lessons, um, on how can we honor certain heritages and cultures of students and community. Um, and then some are, uh, really focused on our habits of success. And so we have five habits of success for our school, um, which are tenacity, leadership, collaboration, communication, and integrity. Um, and I think when the first students first come in, that's a little difficult for them to grasp because it's, you know, a phrase that they learn and, and they hear it a lot. But um, I talk with my students all the time about how uh, as as a professional and as an adult and even as, you know, someone with just like with friends that those things are really important in any relationship as you move on from middle school and high school and whatever they choose to do afterwards. Um, and I really encourage them to think about how those five aspects, um, how those five habits can apply to them every single day. You're teaching directly to transfer. Like this is beautifully done. You're just meeting them where they are. And what I love is you said something that's meaningful. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's being flexible and knowing your students. So we've talked about the power and the importance of fostering relationships. You've already kind of hinted at it, but you obviously are really passionate about your singing voice. So how do teachers become more confident or better understand their singing voice? What are some thoughts on that? Because I think your your background's predominantly performance. Right. I, I did have a, a really kind of big turning point when I was an undergrad of, of what do I pursue specifically? Um, because I love teaching, but I also love performing and love being on the stage. Um, and I think that the way that a lot of our music education programs are built at the college level, it does not provide a lot of flexibility for students to find their voice and be confident in their voice enough to also be performing. And, um, and I think there's an unfortunate stigma with education majors or, or just teachers in general that um, mm-hmm. they can't also do the thing that they're teaching. Uh, and so, so performance, I think, is, uh, is a really important aspect for teachers um, but not just performance, but knowing the voice specifically. Um, and, and again, some at certain as, at certain university levels, um, the, we are not really servicing our pre, pre-service teachers well by providing correct like voice pedagogy classes um, and learning of the voice and also how it develops. And so right. we learn emotional development and we learn physical development as education majors. Um, and those come with the voice, but also knowing knowing how to train specific voices to help make the sections of singing better um, is something that can be a really powerful tool and something that I don't think many teachers get because of how rigid a music education schedule has to be. And I think it relates so much to what you said a second ago. It has to be meaningful connections. So yes, we're taking voice lessons, but that meaningful connection between what we're learning as performers and how to meaningfully connect that to a middle school voice, both girls and boys going through the change, all of that. That's fantastic. So how do you, do you still perform often? I really try to, and obviously, you know, with COVID, um, any performances, I feel like with, with COVID, um, a lot of people's everything kind of just got cut off at the knees. Um, but, um, again, it being meaningful, we know it is, is, what is the music that I am working on or how can I create a musical performance or opportunity that is going to be meaningful and speak to where people are. Um, and, and, you know, uh, music is always a bridge into how people feel or how we process. And so being able to find those types of opportunities, um, are really cool. And so, uh, nowadays, yeah, I perform, um, every, every, every chance that I get. Um, but, uh, I say this not as a, uh, as uh, something that I'm complaining about, but in Columbia specifically now, um, I'm doing a lot of directing, which has been fantastic of either choirs or um, musical theater shows or productions and things like that. And I absolutely love that aspect of it. Um, but I, when you step into that role, then then you don't g- quite get as many opportunities to audition. Um, but uh, but I do love to perform um, and I love, love, love especially collaborating with other performers. Um, and to create again, and, and I know we're repeating a lot of these words, but experiences that matter to people um, mm-hmm. and something that they can plug into and say, oh, that is that is a, an experience that I've gone through or that is that speaks to where I am right now. Mm-hmm. 
because I think especially with COVID, uh, it's just catharsis in that has been so important of, of dealing with your emotions in a way where you're not, um, you know, belligerently confronted with them, but, mm-hmm. uh, but, but in a way that you can process them in a safe place um, and, and music can take us there, I think, really easily. So It's so interesting because there's so much to do as a teacher. The, the paperwork, the teach, the, the all the stuff. There's just so much stuff that goes into being a teacher. But yet you're promoting that teachers should still be performers and find their outlets. How can how can we support each other and find more places? You you're really adamant about promoting teacher performers. Yeah, absolutely. And I think even if it's not a, a solo performance or a, or a you know a duet or or trio kind of performance, um, I tell my students all the time that wherever they go and at whatever the age they are, there will be an opportunity for them to sing. And so um, even here in Columbia, I mean, I, I really came into knowing about the almost innumerable uh, choirs that there are. Uh, and so there are just so many chamber choirs around Columbia. Um, I have the uh, privilege of, of singing and serving um, one um, that's made up primarily of music educators, which I think is fairly unique. Um, but I think that's a, a specific kind of ensemble that can and should be created in any community um, because it's so fantastic to be able to uh, arrive in a choral space where everyone gets it, like they, they know exactly where to go immediately, um, not only in, in, you know, their, in their brains of this is how I arrive to a rehearsal, but vocally of these are the habits that I am bringing to this, this is what I'm teaching my choirs. And so when you get to take out some of the more technical aspects of, um, you know, we'll warm up, and then from there, everybody is is mentally ready to to be at a rehearsal and mentally ready to create this music then the the beauty of the music of of those um, you know really nice nuances just come to life so much more quickly which can be really fulfilling and so um, finding finding ways to do that um, and then through covid also like with my school last year we were on this um, fantastic hybrid model at the very beginning of uh, of uh, the school year and so um, we were, given Fridays as an e-learning day to um, help students catch up. And we were given office hours. Um, And I got clearance from my principal to create a faculty choir, which was super fun. Um, Fun. And so it was fantastic. Uh, And so it was, um, you know, we kind of built that around a social emotional learning time for teachers too, because um, they realized that, you know, we need that time to, to give back to ourselves and so um, it was only about 45 minutes on a Friday morning. And um, honestly, I think even more than singing, just stretching and getting the body ready to sing was their mm-hmm. favorite part um, after a long week. But, uh, but being able to put music together in a low pressure space of if we perform this, if we don't, it doesn't really matter. We're making music for music's sake and we're having fun doing it. And I had people of all experience levels come people who had sung in choirs, people who had never sung before, people who had, you know, singing families, but had never done anything really formal. And so um, that was great because we got to do a lot of music um, that was also uh, really diverse. And so we got to do some uh, by rote pieces. Uh, We got to do, um, we did like the Hail Holy Queen from uh, Sister Act, which was fantastic. Uh, And so, I mean, it was a really great time. Um, And I really missed that because now now that we're serving students full time, um, that opportunity has gone away unless we do an after school, which of course you have teachers who are super busy. Especially on a Friday. Right. Unless you're going to do a beer choir. Beer choir? Exactly. (laughs) I love this. And I I love making music for music's sake. I feel like that's what you're really reminding us that, this is such a cool profession we get to pick. We get to be around students. We get to be around singers. We get to help them unpack those things that matter through music. And what a great reminder, Augie. This is fantastic. Thank you for sharing your story. Hey, yeah. v- before we go to the end of podcast question, what are you having the most fun teaching right now? Give us like a little glimpse into your classroom. So... um about two years ago, we had this fantastic idea to, uh, this is our 10th anniversary at our middle school, and we have this fantastic idea to collaborate on a performance with all of our music department, so band, orchestra, and choir, and, um, and going further than uh, having all of our students do individual performances within their own performance ensembles, um, but really find music that was 
uh, accessible to the middle school level where uh, they could all be performing at the same time. And so that, of course, really snowballed really quickly into something that was really scary and really awesome. Um, but now we're collaborating on this piece. Um, so it's, it's our 10-year anniversary, and so 10 is the really big theme. And so we have put together a 10-piece 10, uh, 10 concert um, of, of some adapted masterworks. And so we're doing cool. some, oh, it's fantastic. It's, uh, we're doing some uh, Vivaldi, we're doing some um, Mozart, we're doing some Beethoven, and then um, we'll flip the switch and move into some more modern works. But um, we're working with an arranger who is adapting full scores and source scores into um, age appropriate uh, you know, rhythms and, and, and ranges and things like that. And so oh, we'll cool. be pre performing this 10 piece concert, um, of our band orchestra and choral students, uh, in May. And so, <clears throat> uh, my students, I keep having to remind them, you know, we work backwards. And so this is in May, but we have 10 pieces of music to, to get ready. Um, and they're already doing fantastic and they're making great music. And next week is actually our first rehearsal, um, with everybody. And so I'm really excited for them to see, the scope of what that is, because I think, especially here in South Carolina, I mean, I don't know that really an event like that has been done before. Um, and so I'm super excited just about um, uh, the, what we're creating and, and having students um, do that. And then also something that's also really exciting uh, is our eighth graders, um, we're beginning work on this next week too, our eighth graders are writing the text for our school's alma mater. So we're, we're setting that to music and then premiering it at this concert in May. Oh, and fun. so, so it's a, it's an artifact and a legacy project that they get to work on of, um, you know, this, this text is going to be attributed to this year's eighth grade class, which I think is going to be super meaningful for them. So I'm excited for that opportunity for them. I love that that red thread of making it meaningful keeps coming back. Music yeah, absolutely. for music's sake, making music, making music meaningful. What a great reminder today. This has been such a fun teacher spotlight. Thank you, Augie, for doing this. Thank you. I always ask the guest to share the one thing that really matters that you want the listener to walk away with. What's that for you today? Uh, I think that it's really important for us as music educators to remember that as we are immersed in music, we forget that that opportunity is not always available for students and that while our classes are obviously the most important thing to us, these students have so much going on. And so um, I think it's just really important to remember that students need that opportunity for art and that outlet. And it is our job as music educators to go the extra mile to advocate for that for them. Um, because none of us would be where we are if no one had advocated for us to have that have that music making opportunity. Uh, and so some students may need that advocacy more than others and some schools or, or districts may need that more than others, but um, that's that's our opportunity as teachers. That's what we get to do. And I think that's really important to remember even when we're in the weeds of it all. I love it. We get to advocate for singers and music and these experiences that matter. Oh, meaningful musical experiences. This has been great. Thank you so much, Augie. I really appreciate talking to you today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Okay, what was your favorite quote? Augie said this super early in the conversation, but he said, you don't have to sacrifice quality of music just because you're working with middle schoolers. Don't forget that. Wherever you go, whatever you do, there's always a place for you to sing. How awesome is it that we get to teach those transferable moments to our singers? I hope you feel inspired and excited by this episode. I'm really thankful that you exist. We all know that you matter, my friend. Music matters, especially all the meaningful things we can learn and experience through music. And I'll see you next time on the Music and Matters podcast.